Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar, Chemical Free and Sustainable Options in Beverage Industry Production. This event brought to you by Beverage Industry is sponsored by Evocal Water Technologies. I'm your moderator, Jessica Jacobson, editor of Beverage Industry. Thanks for joining us. Today's presenters joining us from Evoqua are Barry Riker Sr., Customer Vertical Manager of Food and Beverage for Renewables, David L. McCarty, Industrial UV Sales Manager for the Disinfection Division, and Don Lanini, Ozone Disinfection and Strategic Sales Manager and Product Specialist. And now I'm excited to turn it over to today's presenters. I'm Dave McCarty. I'm Industrial Sales Manager of UV, the Evoqua Division. I want to thank you for your interest and attendance today and look forward to uh, making this informative and providing information that may be valuable. Uh, the agenda, quick introduction about, you know, I really want to talk about uh, UV, the overall technology, uh, prevention of microbial contamination in beverage. Um, we'll talk a little bit about ozone sanitation and disinfection in the beverage markets, and then the reuse industry. So I'm going to be doing the microbial control and contamination. So I'll give a brief overview of UV and the technology and how it works. Uh, the advantages and benefits of using UV, ultraviolet disinfection and photolysis, uses and applications, the critical control points or contamination points in the beverage treatment, uh, beverage water treatment. And then I want to discuss a, a specialty application of using UV for a heat resistant mold application. In 1878, scientists discovered that uh, sunlight killed microorganisms. With the advent of the microscope, they could look into a petri dish with microorganisms, microorganisms swimming around, and when exposed to sunlight, it was actually the germicidal rays that were killing the microbes in, in the petri dish. And then disinfection with UV goes back even to 1910. The first drinking water system was installed in Marseille, France, uh, for prevent contamination for public water supplies. And then the advent of UV for wastewater disinfection, where the EPA was trying to uh, minimize the amount of chlorine in the environment. So in 1978, the first installations for UV and wastewater were, were um, installed. And then you can get into the uh, extrapolation of the um, ad adaptation of UV for wastewater reuse. Um, you can even see in uh, fluorescent lamps or UV mercury lamps were invented in 1901. UV started to be used in um, industrial industrial uses, especially in the beverage industry, pretty much in the 1980s. And then it was found that UV was effective against uh, chlorine-resistant pathogens, protozoans, cryptosporidium, and giardia. And then there was a drinking water guidance manual that actually uh, showed how to adapt UV to different drinking water supplies. So how, what does UV do and how does it work? So <clears throat> UV disinfection is a physical process as opposed to chemical disinfection. The UV rays penetrate the cell wall of a microorganism. The photons hit the DNA reproductive molecules and fuse some of the proteins together so that the microorganism is damaged and cannot reproduce. The Microbiological definition of cell death is the inability of a microbe to reproduce, so it can cause spoilage or disease. It is in the 200 to 280 nanometers UVC, as you can see in the circle uh, and below, um, and that is the germicidal range. UV can also be used for photolysis and photochemical uh, breakdown. Uh, well, the photons are actually used to break down certain compounds, and we'll discuss that a little bit and how it might be applied in the beverage industry. It's important to know the different types of UV lamps on the market. Typical low-pressure, high-output lamps, amalgam lamps, have a high electrical efficiency, a medium UVC output per length of lamp. It's monochromatic at 254 nanometers and very, fairly efficient, 35% UVC compared to the input power. The disadvantage is it takes a lot of lamps, the higher the flow rate, to be able to uh, disinfect water in a reactor. A medium pressure lamp, not as efficient. It's only 15% efficiency in the germicidal range compared to the input power, but it's got a very high UVC output per uh, unit length of lamp uh, and is polychromatic. 
The advantages of medium pressure is in the number of components in the space. A medium pressure system might have one lamp compared to a low pressure output lamp system that might have 25 or 30 lamps. So you can replace one, have one typical medium pressure lamp replace a, a number of low pressure lamps. So a smaller footprint, fewer components. So there's advantages to both. So what are the advantages of UV? It's effective against a very wide range of organisms, including chlorine resistant pathogens, as I mentioned, very high efficiency, uh, reduced capex costs, you know, as far as uh, installation costs and operating costs, it creates no harmful carcinogen carcinogenic byproducts or taste and odors, because if you add chemicals to the water, they can alter the, uh, the chemistry of the water, requires no storage, handling, or transportation. So it's very easy to use. You just turn it on and off when you need it. It just requires power. And as I mentioned, very easy to install and very easy to maintain. So sustainability-wise, reduction in the use of chemicals for the environment is considered a benefit. Uh, no safety hazards as compared to chemicals and aids in reuse by removing microcontaminants using less water. So where is UV used? It is used in just about every water application you can imagine. Anything from municipal, from wastewater and reuse to drinking water plants, pools and water parks, aquaculture, marine, soft drinks and breweries, which we talk about today, food and dairy, electronics and pharmaceuticals. It's really any process that is chemical intolerant or where there are chlorine resistant microorganisms. That's the advantage of UV. So what are the applications? For the beverage industry, it can be a multiple applications and, and uses in the plant depending on your process. So incoming city water or well water can be used, you know, depending on the quality of the incoming water, post uh, granular activated carbon. This is the most common use of UV in a beverage plant because when you take the city water, uh, remove the chlorine with the uh, activated carbon, you then have uh, unprotected water and uh, carbon towers can breed bacteria. So UV is often used and that's most often. Process water before membranes, RO membranes, prevent vial falling, and then after just permeate disinfection for the RO because RO in itself is not a sterilization technology, so their microorganisms can uh, still pass through. Um, it can be the final rinse if chlorine is used in sanitation. It's used in liquid sweeteners uh, and some fruit juices. I'll highlight one of the uh, installations that we have, case history. And for recycled water, it's a part of a process that could be used back in the, in the plant for cooling water, boiler feed, plant wash down, et cetera. Photolysis wise, it's very good at ozone destruction. So if you're sanitizing your system with ozone, you rinse out your pipes and your tank, you can just turn the UV system on and it can break down the ozone and you're off and running. So there's no uh, delay in the process and it's very easy to use for sanitation. And then uh, UV can be used for dechlorination. So you might have chlorine in your water. If it has to be free chlorine, you can break down free chlorine using uh, high doses of UV. And it's a replacement for GAC in some circumstances, particularly when there's no space uh, available to put in big GAC towers. So question for the audience. How many of you use UV after activated carbon, the most common use in beverage processing uh, water, and pre and post reverse osmosis for product or ingredient water in your plants? So from the poll, it appears that uh, people uh, use the UV as an application in their process water after carbon and before or after reverse osmosis, 28% say yes. 48, 43% say no, and 30% say unsure. So that's a good uh, representative of the people in the uh, uh, attendance of how they may or may not use UV in a plant. So moving on, okay, so how do you size a UV system? The flow rate is, the most, is one of the most important, obviously. Um, we need to know the uh, maximum uh, flow rate that's going through a UV reactor. You know, we need to know the minimums to make sure that there's no overheating. And if you have recirculation, we'd like to know the recirculation rate for that loop. Water quality, UV transmittance is extremely important. It is the amount of UV light 
that penetrates uh, the water. And there are things that absorb UV from turbidity to dissolved organics and uh, TOC. Color is a big absorber of UV. Are there metal concentrations? You know, these are the things that we're going to ask about your water quality. The required disinfection. UV is not a sterilization process per se. It is a log reduction method. So if you want to get 99.99% or four log reduction of total organisms in your system and you want to remove those, we have to size it accordingly with the proper UV dose. We need to know a little bit about the plant hydraulics and then if you need redundancy depending on how critical the operation is. So again, we size UV on what's called UV dose. The dose units are milliwatt seconds per centimeter squared, millijoules per centimeter squared, or microwatt seconds per centimeter squared. They're all kind of equivalent uh, of the same units. Uh, millijoules per centimeter squared is most often used. So we know that very few microorganisms, if any, are resistant to a sufficient doses of UV. So general rules of thumb, you know, every company seems to have their own guidelines for UV dose. And it can be anything from the standard application of UV dose, which is 30 millijoules per centimeter squared, uh, up to 40 millijoules per centimeter squared, which will kill, give you a four log reduction of bacteria, E. coli, Pseudomonas, Legionella, et cetera. For protozoans, Cryptosporidium giardia, these are more drinking water pathogens, greater than 30 millijoules is used. And then there are some types of organisms that are more resistant to UV. So if you have bacillus spores and yeast and mold, they take a much higher UV dose, greater than 90 millijoules per centimeter squared. And then the most resistant organism to UV is adenovirus. So it takes greater than 186 millijoules per centimeter squared. This is a set by the US EPA for drinking water standard to get a four log reduction of adenovirus. And different companies either go to the extreme or general rules of 30 to 40 millijoules. So it's just a um, matter of preference and guidelines from the quality department. So here's a common representation of a beverage treatment process scheme. So you have your incoming water, typically goes through some kind of multimedia or ultrafiltration, can go through reverse osmosis immediately. Um, you have, can add chlorine even after RO to make sure that any microorganisms that get through are, are destroyed. It goes into a storage tank. So incoming water is an area of contamination. Before RO is an area of contamination in a storage tank because um, that has a headspace and you can get air entrapment of organisms within the storage tank. That can be an area of contamination. And then as I mentioned, carbon towers uh, can breed microorganisms. They have to be sanitized often and UV is very often used after there's a cartridge filter and then the ultraviolet disinfection it can go to blending or packaging, it can be passed on to another reverse osmosis system for the purified water. Then you'll see an ozone system in there for CIP and uh, there's an ozone destruct UV system. This is just one example of where UV is used in a beverage process. So that's the overview of UV and the most common uses of UV in a beverage plant, whether it be beverage, uh, bottled water, uh, breweries, distilleries. So that's just an overview of where UV is used and the advantages. Then there are very specialized UV systems for different specialty applications. We actually had a, a customer who was a citrus producer. They found that they had a type of microorganism that was resistant to uh, pasteurization. In fact, it actually is called allocyclobacillus. It actually germinated in pasteurization. So they didn't have many options because they pasteurized the water and they'd get an ex expansion of these microorganisms in their juices. We found that UV um, in a very specialized system with a small um, thin film design to pass over that eliminated these heat resistant molds and became a standard for this particular processor. So these types of systems are what we use in sugar syrups with low UV transmittance. You can use it in some types of applications with lower UV transmittance and uh, just a specialty application that I wanted to bring to you. So thank you very much. I'm going to go on to our next speaker, which is Don Lanini, and he'll talk about ozone.
All right, Dave. Hey, thank you for that. Uh, and uh, thank you for going through that presentation. Very interesting. Um, let's get started on ozone for disinfection and sanitization in your facility. Here's a little uh, outline of what we're going to discuss today so everybody can follow along. A little brief history on uh, ozone, ozone uses and applications, uh, components required for all ozone applications, and ozone in the beverage water applications. Of course, advantages and benef benefits of ozone for your product. Like Dave, just to give a little history of ozone, I like sharing this information with everyone so they can see that ozone has been used for quite some time. It's not a new emerging technology. It's been around forever. And as you can see on this timeline, uh, when it was, when, when it was first discovered and used in the life cycle to where we are today, and we really are seeing ozone, uh, being adopted at a really huge compounded annual growth rate up into that 20, 20 point, uh, Kager growth rate. What is ozone? I'm sure everybody is aware of what ozone is. I like to review this just so, uh, we know that, uh, ozone is the tritomic form of oxygen. We're working with oxygen and it is a highly reactive product of energy, electricity, or UV where we're actually fracturing O2 molecules into O1 and they recombine as O3, ozone. And it is one of the most powerful commercially available oxidants. And you could see from this simple uh, graph on this slide, comparing it to two other well-known uh, oxidizers that I'm sure everyone is aware of. It just, uh, I like to show this just so everybody can see how much more powerful uh, ozone is than hydrogen peroxide and chlorine. It's it's really to plant some seeds and get everybody thinking about where else they might use ozone in their process uh, since if they have, you know, an ozone system for making final product. Why is ozone power so powerful? It's because of the three simultaneous reactions. We're oxidizing, we're disinfecting, and we're decomposing. Oxidation, we're actually, actually lysising the cell walls. In the same time, uh, we're precipitating out suspended molecules. It works really well as a precipitant for some applications, maybe some of the pretreatment. And at the same time, we're disinfecting. We're killing those bacteria, viruses, molds, cysts, parasites. It's effective against all common foodborne pathogens. And one of the coolest things about ozone is when it's done working, it decomposes back to oxygen. How is ozone used in your industry? Again, I like to play on the disinfection term because we're disinfecting, you know, your, your product water against microorganisms. We're also disinfecting, you know, your bottles um, prior to, you know, filling them or as you are filling them. Uh, again, since we have ozone in the water and in the water is being delivered to the filler, you're disinfecting the wetted parts of that equipment uh, while you're sending that water to the to the to the bottles. And again, we're disinfecting surfaces of the bottles, the sealed cap of that bottled water. And of course, as you're filling, we're getting some off gassing. We're going to disinfect uh, uh, against any potential airborne microorganisms that might be present above that water in the bottle. Where's ozone used? And hopefully you guys are using this in all of your uh, potential applications in your facility, but pretreatment at the source where you could be transferring in the piping, uh, the storage, and even uh, some of you might be getting a, a off-site source in a tanker where you can have ozone added to it to keep it disinfected and disinfect that tanker. And, and again, inside of the plant, the applications is the product water uh, clean in place if you're not using it, it's an option. Uh, again, the storage silos, bottle and cap washing, and again, the equipment and surface of that equipment being sanitized. Quick question for you all. Are you having challenges with maintaining dissolved ozone concentration levels? Please uh, select and submit so we can address any of those questions as they come up. I see a few of you are pretty good at maintaining con dissolved ozone concentrations. 
And it's unfortunate that quite a few of you aren't using ozone. Everybody needs ozone. Continuing on, a little bit about ozone and methods to produce ozone that uh, not everyone could be aware of. of as I mentioned earlier, uh, ozone is a, a product of energy and UV light actually will fracture O2 molecules into O1, allowing them to recombine as O3. Here you're going to get small concentrations by weight. Uh, uh, so it's somewhat limited in what you can do. I'm not sure if everybody's affair, uh, aware of electrolysis or electrolytic cells. These devices are actually separating the oxygen out of the H2O in um, fracturing, using electricity to fracture those O2 molecules into O1, recombining as O3. Uh, here again, uh, really specialized applications, small concentrations, and some challenges with its ability to react quickly to controlling a set concentration. And of course, today's current state of the art is corona discharge, and some might call it plasma technology. But this is most likely what, if you're using ozone, this is what you would be using in your facility to disinfect your water. Some of the critical components for a successful application. Again, we're, we're actually taking oxygen and converting it into ozone. So like water feedstock, we're looking at atmospheric air feedstock. We want to improve this feedstock. So we're taking compressed air and pushing it through an oxygen concentrator where we're actually separating out the nitrogen and most of the other gases. And we're delivering a really dry, uh, enriched stream of oxygen to the ozone reactor cell. The reactor cells where we're actually driving a high voltage to strike a current to fracture these O2s in, in this cell. And uh, to generate the ozone, we're going to get out of that dry free gas. And from there, we have to look at the mass transfer. We're, we're making a gas, and now we need to get this gas dissolved into the water so we can meet the concentration and the disinfection uh, required for your products. And from that, we want to make sure that we're controlling uh, the concentrations and making it safe to meet your requirements. These four components are critical for every ozone application to uh, illustrate great success. And with ozone, there's a couple ways to meet disinfection requirements. We really want to understand concentration and time and contact. And I'm sure everybody's aware of CT, this, this approach to disinfection, to where we can get there with higher concentrations and shorter period of time in contact, or we can use a lower concentration and a longer period of time in contact to get that disinfection. And you can see the FDA uh, has some recommendations out there, and these vary, but really it is up to you all to develop to develop and validate your ozone concentrations and contact time to meet your disinfection requirements for your products. Here's a little case study that uh, I'm sure some of you might have experienced and struggle with. And based on the um, on the questionnaire, I can see that there are some challenges, but it's not uncommon to where you have uh, multiple products that require different concentrations and time and contact. And uh, we've worked with several of those applications to come up with a, a, um, a solution to meet that uh, quick change requirement in concentration control. Really uh, dissolved ozone control is, is a, is, is not that easy, but, uh, you know, with a package system to where you can validate what you're delivering, you can be you can meet your requirements very easy versus um, looking at a bunch of loose components and having to uh, put them together to meet your requirements. So with uh, the package system approach really helps uh, manage any of the inconsistencies you might see from the variations in process. And of course, the advantages of ozone, you're going to save time. It's a, it's a really fast sanitizer. You can see we can get up to um, five, six log reduction in a, uh, in a couple of minutes. Uh, of course, it's safe when it's controlled. It's very effective at low residuals. 
yes, it's there's safe workplace exposure, exposure limits. Um, the systems include instruments for for quick feedback and validation and reporting uh, of your uh, dissolved ozone concentrations to meet your disinfection. And, and ozone has really a long, impressive safety record for over 100 years. It saves money. Ozone is inexpensive, econom economically feasible, uh, offering you less downtime, as I mentioned before, faster changeover for different products that you might be running and uh, with a package system, less out of spec conditions uh, with inline validation, knowing your results. And of course, here's the list of approvals that um, really is accepted in the uh, marketplace today. And that's it for ozone. Thanks, Dave. Um, I'm going to try to tie those technical concepts uh, together in the context of sustainability. Uh, like most of you, we are on our own sustainability journey, and we've decided to align ourselves with the UN Sustainable um, Development Goals. We're monitoring our, monitoring our progress, both in terms of our handprint, which is how we enable our customers to be sustainable, and our footprint, which is how sustainable we are in our own internal operations. Here are your sustainability goals. <clears throat> and uh, as everybody's well aware, they largely center around you know, saving water, withdrawing less water, using less water per unit of product produced, uh, and to a certain extent, saving energy as well. When I think about how a beverage processor would approach uh, sustainability, you know, it boils down to, yes, saving water and, and saving energy, but I, I consider there to be kind of two tiers of, of things you can do. The, the lowest hanging fruit, in my opinion, is in-plant efficiency type upgrades. So adding uh, brine recovery RO, you know, treating your cooling tower water and getting more cycles out of it before you blow it down, using non-potable quality water for CIP, et cetera, et cetera. So relatively low capital investments, uh, but still move the needle slightly in terms of sustainability. Once that's done, you have to look at the wastewater plant and all, all roads are inevitably leading to uh, to wastewater treatment and reuse, which I will try to skim through. Okay, as I mentioned, you're prior prioritizing your sustainability. You're figuring out what to do first. You have to benchmark your plants. So first of all, you need to know which plants are more sustainable than, than others. And then within those plants, go and pr prioritize sustainability projects. Uh, and you have to take the local variables into consideration. What are your costs? What is your equipment age? What is the operator competency? What are the, the, the regulatory changes that you might be exposed to? Location to location. So even though you can set a, a, a lofty and admirable goal from the top, uh, when it comes time to execute it, there's a lot of things to take into, into consideration to look at it holistically from a plant level. Okay, poll time. Is your facility planning to projects to reduce its water or energy footprint? I'm going to end that one early to try to catch up on time. But yeah, not, not surprisingly, but most of you are. All right, stepping through those implants, kind of uh, incremental savings things. You know, we're, we're talking about supply of water, as, as I mentioned. This is about efficiency, it's, and it's, it's about um, quality. So if you don't have a brine recovery RO and you can add one and increase your um, yield from 70% to 90%, that can have a large impact on, you know, hitting a sustainability target for a period of time. The boiler, we're concerned about water quality, but we're concerned about protecting an asset that is, you know, often the, the heart of production. Uh, even though a lot of low, low pressure boilers, they don't need an RO quality water, often you can put RO quality or an RO in front of them to give them better water quality to get more cycles out of that boiler feed water. The cooling tower is a major consumer of water. It's also pretty flexible being in the middle um, you can reuse the cooling tower blowdown elsewhere in the plant. I've heard of it used, uh, treated, and then used as first and second rinse CIP. You can also use uh, wastewater as feed for the, the cooling tower system, which is what I meant to say on the boiler slide. Um, so, yeah, cycle it up. Um, put a filtration system. Get more uses of that cooling tower water before you blow it down or use that water elsewhere in your plant. On the washdown and CIP, we've got a lot of chemical use here, um, you know, often liberal uh, chemical use. And sure, you can get chemical disinfection, but as we strive towards sustainability, we're trying to get away from chemicals. There's there's a few undesirable characteristics of handling a lot of chemicals th through your plant that, uh, that we're trying to get away from. Uh, one, you don't want to be moving big barrels around and have a spill. 
Uh, two, you've often got uh, TDS limits that are becoming part of your wastewater permit. Uh, this is becoming a thing in, in California in, in particular. So you're now incented to keep high concentrations of chemicals out of your drain to the TDS limit. And then finally, as uh, biological wastewater treatment gains in popularity, when you've got, you know, disinfection chemicals, um, paracetic acid and quaternary ammonia and so on, that can accumulate in your wastewater plant and actually cause, uh, you're, you're, you're trying to kill the biology in your plant and you're inadvertently killing the biology in, in your wastewater treatment plant by mistake. Okay, quick walk through wastewater. There's a change in mentality. Wastewater is viewed as a cost. It's viewed as um, being difficult, uh, a pain in the neck, and it's it's viewed as the last thing that people generally want to spend money on because it's, it's not directly contributing to production growth. But the, ch the change in mentality is that high strength organic wastewater is increasingly being viewed as as a resource instead of a instead of a waste stream. So it's it's a switch of looking at it as as almost a feedstock in, instead of a waste stream. It's got you know a lot of uh, energy potential with BOD, and then it's got a lot of nutrient uh, content as well. So we're seeing more and more food and beverage processors um, investigate anaerobic digestion, where they can get their BOD reduction and, and create biogas and renewable energy in the process. And we're seeing more municipalities even isolate high strength industrial waste so they can capture the energy potential of, of the um, wastewater, they can recover nutrients from it and turn those into profitable byproducts. Quick crash course, um, we can skip DAF on the left here. Aerobic systems will give you the best effluent quality. They will, they will remove nutrients, but the downside is they come at a significant operating cost. Uh, part of that is in the energy that you have to put into the system. You know, we are powering blowers to aerate the wastewater and feed the aerobic bacteria. You can see that if you put 100 kilograms of COD into an aerobic system, half of that comes out in the form of waste activated sludge. And so we're talking now additional unit processes um, to dewater, hold, store, transport, sludge. Anaerobic systems don't use oxygen, so they actually have about 10% the operating cost of an aerobic system. Um, if you look at that same 100 kilograms of COD, only 5% comes out in, in biomass, 90% less. So much sludge, must less sludge handling, no energy inputs, and the byproduct is, is methane, which is about, or biogas, which is about 75% methane. Looking at pros and cons here again, <clears throat> the, the con of the anaerobic system is, is that you don't get any nutrient removal. So if you have a nutrient um, discharge limit, then you need to have an aerobic system after it in some way, shape, or form uh, to address that. But it is the most cost-effective way to remove 90% of your, your BOD with, with next to no operating cost. So generally, when we see high-strength wastewaters, uh, they're good candidates for anaerobic pretreatment, and then we'll add the aerobic polishing if needed. Aerobic, as I mentioned, high operating costs, uh, best effluent quality. You will get your uh, nutrients removal here. If, if you want to do direct discharge to um, to a river, you need to have an aerobic system. If you want uh, to reuse water in your plant, you're typically, yeah, you're gonna have an, you're gonna have membranes in some way, shape or form after an anaerobic system. Typically you would go anaerobic to an aerobic MBR and then to um, RO and then disinfection. This is what I was just explaining that when, <clears throat> when we think about advanced wastewater treatment. We, we think about the capital investment required in, in wastewater in, in general. If it's going to be expensive, we, we may as well do it right. So we describe advanced wastewater treatment as anaerobic pretreatment, assuming the wastewater is, is strong enough, then right sizing that aerobic system. So if you have, if you have a reuse goal of, of any way, ra rather than sizing that air high operating cost aerobic system for the full wastewater flow and load, you size it for a tenth of the load because you put the anaerobic system in front of it. And then if you've only got 100,000 gallons a day of reuse need, well, you just you size your reuse system for only 100,000 gallons a day rather than the whole thing. Here's what that might look like. Um, here we have big circle on the left being an anaerobic pretreatment system, a virus called BVF, followed by anaerobic. This is an, this is an MBR, so we would have an aerobic biological tank in the middle. We would have uh, two membrane tanks after that. You could go right out of those membrane tanks um, with right to your cooling tower, 
or if you wanted to go to a, a high pressure boiler, then you would go to um, an RO first. And then of course, in, in both cases, disinfect before you go back into the plant. That's it for me. Thank you everyone for a great presentation. Before we have our presenters address some questions that have been submitted throughout the program, I wanted to remind you that we'd love your feedback in our webinar survey to help improve our programs. All right, so one of the questions we received said, can UV technology be an alternative for water chlorination? I'll take that question. Very good question, thank you. Uh, typically not, okay? So UV is, has no residual. So it can uh, inactivate micro organisms at that point of use, but downstream there is no protection. So in the U.S., <clears throat> the, uh, for drinking water, for example, <clears throat> chlorination is required even if UV is used to kill um, chlorine-resistant microorganisms. With that said, there are countries like the Netherlands that are, do not like chlorine, and they use UV only. But those are very controlled systems. They're monitored. They're very short pipe runs. And so that's the situation where you can use UV alone. Wonderful. And then we have a question asking, what flow rate do you have UV equipment? Okay, so UV can used and can be used anything from a few gallons a minute to millions of gallons per day. Um, the largest system that Evoqua makes for, for that is probably about 20 million gallons a day in one reactor. But it also depends on the water quality and the required disinfection limits. Okay, and then we have a question asking, is it possible to use UV in raw milk? Are there any studies on this? UV has been tried on raw milk many times. Um, it can actually kill microorganisms. The problem with UV is it will alter the fats in the milk, so it's not recommended. It'll have taste and odor consequences. Okay, so that kind of transitions into another question that was asked, asking, is it possible to use ozone in yogurt lines? As a sanitizer between runs, yes. With the product, you would, you would not use ozone. So once you okay. run your product, you clean, the, you clean the lines, you would rinse with a ozone disinfectant prior to the next production run. Great, and then we have a question asking, bottle caps too much tight, is there any reason of ozone or microbiological effect? Uh, the ozone will disinfect the caps if that's the intention or the concern. So depending on how you receive the caps, store the caps and handle the caps may dictate that you want to do some type of disinfection to that before you cap your product, or your bottle with it. Great. And then we have a question asking, what is the optimal temperature for ozonated water surface disinfection, i.e. bottles and caps? So ozone does have a half-life for effectiveness and its half-life is predicated on water temperature. So actually the colder the water, the longer ozone is gonna um, be at a specific concentration. So anywhere up to, you could safely use ozone in controlled concentration for those applications up to 80 degrees F and feel pretty confident that uh, you should not have any concerns using that as a primary disinfectant for those components. Okay, and then we have a question stating, sanitation, sterilization, disinfection seem to be used interchangeably. Are they the same? In the way I present it, no, they aren't the same. We look at this as microbial control or log reduction. The way I explain sanitization is I'm looking at three log or better uh, microbial reduction. Uh, disinfection is up to that four and five log reduction, even six log reduction of microbes. And then anything six log reduction and greater, I qualify that as sterilization. 
And you can meet all of those areas with ozone. It is all dependent on concentration and time in contact. Okay, and then we have a question asking, if they use high intensity UV or ozone in the short term, is there an effect on the beverage nutrients? There can be. It, it depends on the nutrients in the beverage, but typically the concentrations and dose control are managed so that you will not uh, uh, cause an effect to the product. So it all depends on the process parameters and the product. Uh, yes, some products you might have some effects that are undesirable using those two as a disinfectant. Yeah, okay. and for UV, and <clears throat> I was going to say, for UV, same thing. The UV is not going to alter the water in any way. So if it goes into the ingredients, that, that won't have any change. And then we have a question asking, how do I know if my UV is really performing since there's no way to check before and after the UV except for the microbiological testing that takes 24 hours to get the results? That is an excellent question. <clears throat> um, so with chlorine, for example, you measure chlorine residual. If you use heat, you know that if you heated it for so much time at a certain temperature that you get the desired disinfection. With UV, you need a very accurate UV sensor um, that senses the intensity of the lamps going through the, the water and the flow rate. And knowing those two, um, parameters, then you can be assured that you're getting the proper UV dose. And as I might have mentioned, m many systems or most systems are validated by third parties to show you the performance over a range of flows and transmittance that that UV system will perform. So as long as the sensor is telling you that and the algorithms are in the program for the UV controls, then you can be assured that it's getting its proper treatment. Okay, and then we have a question asking, if UV or ozone are used to disinfect water for bottling, should it be a CCP point in HACCP? Dave, do you wanna answer that? I would say yes to both of those questions. Yeah, I would say so too. I mean, yeah. For bottled water especially, you're going to want a residual of UV or UV, uh, I mean of ozone that goes into the, the bottle itself to disinfect the container and make sure that the, the water is sufficiently treated. With UV, you don't have that same situation. Um, some plants don't use ozone. They might use UV instead of ozone or the combination of the two. Um, I've seen processes where it's UV followed by ozone to make sure you have a double barrier approach. Great. And then we have a question asking, how often should I calibrate my dissolved ozone sensors? And what should my dissolved ozone concentration be? Good questions. And that's subject to the manufacturer, the, the, the device manufacturer that you're currently using and the quality of the water. So most of the manufacturers will give recommended periods. Uh, these devices are typically ampermetric probes and they do have an electrolyte in them that will fade over time and the membranes will oxidize over time. So typically it's not uncommon to see those things being um, maintained uh, quarterly, uh, semi-annually, so it's a very common practice. You should recalibrate if you take grab samples and you see something that is not that that's not comparable to your your immediate grab samples. And concentration is really predicated by contact time or or your specified requirements. And uh, the U.S. EPA and the FDA gave recommended guidelines, and it's a minimum of 0 0.1 ppm in a closed container for five minutes a time. So you can get there several different ways, but uh, it, it does give you an area to work within to meet some minimal disinfection requirements. Great. And then we have a question asking if UV and ozone has to be used in a series, which should be first and do you really need two in the series? 
are, are they trying to get us to argue? Dave, I think somebody's trying to get us to argue. No. Um, Dave, in most cases in beverage facilities, typically incoming water is treated with UV. Uh, prior to filling is where you would use ozone in that like application. Dave, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, Don, I think, you know, they are complementary, you know, technologies. And so different places within the treatment process, advantages for UV for that point of disinfection to make microbial control and limit the mi microorganisms in the water. And then to be used with ozone, the ozone is a disinfectant that, um, you know, gives some residual and they both have their advantages in that situation. And then if you're sanitizing, you just turn on the ozone, you recirculate it through the pipe. And then when you're done, you can just turn on the UV. So the UV is located after the ozone generator. And then we take out the ozone and then you're off to, you know, to processing. Right. And the only other time you would consider uh, not using one or the other is based on your source. Uh, different sources re have different requirements to meet disinfection, and there are some challenges with source water that may make one of the technologies uh, uh, less likely to be used. Okay, and then we have a question asking, can ozone gas by itself be used on bottles and caps? Yes, but no. It's really hard to control and measure concentration and time in contact to get some disinfection credit. So in theory, yes, it will oxidize and disinfect microorganisms, but without measuring and controlling concentration, it's really hard to validate what the net disinfection results would be without some, you know, grow out tests that take the 24 hours to confirm. Okay, and then we have a question asking, is there a preferred water source, city water, nano filtered, or RO to be used for ozonated water surface disinfection? Oh, well, the cleaner the water, uh, the easier to maintain ozone concentration because there's nothing in that water to compete or consume that ozone. So you'll, you'll extend the half-life as if there's no loading that can uh, consume the ozone that's in the water. So I any improvement, but, you know, a lot of facilities will just use municipal source where, you know, we're actually removing chlorine or removing ozone. Uh, and it takes a little bit more energy to get a desirable concentration with that source water. But uh, in in particular, multiple sources are used. It's measuring a res a, a resultant concentration so you can get that disinfection you're looking for. Okay, and then we have time for one last question, which is, what are the biggest mistakes people make with wastewater or sustainability projects? Yeah, wrong technology choice, for sure. <clears throat> you can have two plants five miles down the road from each other, you know, one that gets wastewater treatment right uh, and one that doesn't. Uh, so one might be compliant and, and the other one not. Uh, one might have a million dollars in operating costs and, and the other one not. Uh, so there can be competitive implications to, to getting that right. Um, so we suggest you consult with, you know, engineers and, and vendors that have more than one way to solve the problem. So you get a good look at pros and cons of different ways to do it. Wonderful. Well, that is all the time we have for questions today. Please join me in thanking Barry, David, and Don for their presentation, as well as our sponsor, Evoca Water Technologies. We appreciate your time and hope you have found this webinar to be a valuable experience.